My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. I cried unto thee in the daytime, and thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted in thee, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. But thou art he who took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not thou far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bastion have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melteth in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like the potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. For thou hast brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare at me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. For thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. I will declare your name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. Will I praise thee? Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye seed of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried... He heard, I will praise thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before him. For the kingdoms of the Lord are the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All the fat of the earth shall eat and worship the Lord, and they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none shall be able to keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted unto the Lord for a generation. And they shall come and declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. Wow. Mm. Lord, we thank you. Thank you. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Yes, to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory and blessing. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him that sits on the throne yes. and unto the Lamb yes. forever and ever. A lover of our souls, Lord. Take us deep into your heart.
Open the eyes of our understanding, Lord. Holy Spirit, lead us. That we may be one with you. That we may know even as we are known. for your presence, Lord. Father, that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. That the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened. That we would know what is the hope of your calling. And what the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints and what the exceeding greatness of your power to us word who believe according to the working according to the working of your power which works in us mightily lord which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and set him at your own right hand far above all principalities powers dominion and might and every name that is named Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father but through me. That is a picture of the tabernacle. See, Jesus is the tabernacle. Everything under the old covenant pointed to Christ. And see, the tabernacle is the way to the Father. Mm -hmm. And so, I am the way is the outer court. The truth, the inner court. The life, the Holy of Holies. No man comes in the Father but through me. Passing from the outer court to the inner court to the Holy of Holies. David had a revelation of this, he got a revelation of the way to the Father. Because the Father said to him, as in Psalm 27, he said, Seek ye my face. And David said, My heart, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. A face to face intimacy. And of course, we know that David was a man after God's own heart. And the Father anointed him. He anointed him for intimacy. And it says in Isaiah 55 that David was given to us for a witness, mm -hmm. a leader and a commander to the people. He was given to us for a witness. And it says in Amos chapter 9, verse 11, in that day, that's right now. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen. That tabernacle of David is the revelation of Jesus Christ through this revelation of the tabernacle. The way, the truth, the life. The way to the Father's heart. And that raising up the tabernacle of David, he's not literally going to build this building, it's this revelation. 
to the Father's heart. This place of intimacy in the secret place. Psalm 91, of course, a psalm of David. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And so the Lord's been bringing me into a revelation now for eight years in regards to this. I'll just share just a little bit, but <clears throat> uh, about almost 16 years ago, I had a lady, I had done some work at her house, and, and uh, some point after that, she called me up and said, the Lord has a word for you. I have a word of the Lord for you. And she came to our house and uh, delivered this word. She washed my feet. She baptized me. She anointed me, consecrated me, and she delivered this word. And the essence of the word was, um, I am doing a new thing, a new thing, a new thing in the earth, and you are part of the new thing I am doing. Do not wrestle in the spirit realm over this. I am truly doing a new thing. Do not look to the Christian trends of the day. I am doing a new thing. I am reckoning that the world belonged to me, solely to me, and I rejoice and am glad in it. And then that word, he also he said many things, but he also said, Now rest in me, son, Sabbath rest, and watch me do all the doing in and through you. So, and other things he said in that is, is see you, see me, no difference. See you, see me, no difference. You know, I read that and I go, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> I know that's not true yet, but that's what he sees. And so I kind of put that away in a drawer Seven years later, of course, the Sabbath, the Sabbath and years is seven years. Seven years later, this revelation started coming in regards to the key of David, to the key of the house of David. And it's been a journey. <laughs> it's been a progressive revelation. Um, and I, I give my entire life to this revelation now in the last three years. Well, on 9-9-2012, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me, and I was, I was like hyperventilating. <laughs> and the Lord said, the time is short. Seek me like you have never sought me before. The church is behind the ball. And that behind the ball, I believe, is in regards to Intimacy. That we're behind the ball in regards to intimacy. And so we have to press in with everything. And that was a word to me, but it's also a general word. It's true, the time is short. And, and we have to make that decision to come out of the world and pursue him with all our hearts. And uh, at the end of that year, 2012, I went on a 12-day fast to close out the year. And one of the things the Lord spoke to me is that that 2012 was going to be a year of acceleration. He said the time was short. Seek me. But then he said it was going to be acceleration. And that acceleration has continued. We're in a spiritual acceleration right now. And if, if you'll set yourself apart to him, he will accelerate your spiritual maturity and bring us to the place where we need to be. With the things that are coming, there's some <laughs> very challenging things coming. I'm not going to talk about those things. But the Lord tells us in Isaiah 26, 20, he says, Come, my people, enter into thy chambers. He's talking about this place of intimacy, this secret place. Come, my people, and enter into the chambers and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be passed. There's challenging things coming, and we're not going anywhere. <laughs> we have to come into a place of intimacy, and there is a place of immunity in God. Yes. Complete protection, where the enemy can't touch you. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. The enemy could not touch Jesus. Right. Oh yeah, he'd come against, try and come against our minds and all those things. But he cannot take us out if we're abiding in the secret place. And that's the whole revelation that, I, that, that he's given me to bring forth. And it's continuing to come. But um, we have to get to that place. And it is our destiny. Many are called. Few are chosen. Why is that? Because few choose him or few choose to do what he asks them to do. He, he chooses all to come to him. Right. But there is a way to approach him, isn't there? So the chosen are the ones that come. <laughs> and so we have to choose to come into that place of intimacy a deep place of intimacy with the Lord and it's something I've sought my whole life and, and it's been amazing to me I've been in church pretty much my entire life you know I gave my heart to the Lord in a Baptist church when I was 7-8 years old sitting on a hard pew and there was no fanfare I just I just remember vividly making that. I didn't go forward or anything else, but I remember. And since then, he implanted a very deep desire to know him, mm -hmm. which church has never satisfied. Yeah. And it's been amazing to me that in all the churches I've been in, no one has taught me intimacy. It's incredible to me. The most important thing in the Lord intimacy and it's almost not taught at all. I'm not saying nobody does but I haven't seen it. <laughs> in any of the churches I've been in teaching me how to enter into intimacy with the Lord because they don't know how. It goes beyond prayer. I mean prayer obviously is, is the language but it's beyond that. It's, it's coming into a certain revelation David came into this revelation. But it came through much affliction. <laughs> David was afflicted. King Saul was in pursuit of his life. Imagine the king with all his forces coming down on you to take you out. But in all that affliction, it brought him low. <laughs> It says in Psalm 116, I was made low and the Lord helped me. So there is a humbling in coming to his place of intimacy. We have to humble ourselves. Of course, in the great fall is the pride, right? And so to come back to him, there has to be that humility and that brokenness. I think it's Matthew 21, 44, I could be wrong, but where the Lord says, Whosoever falls upon this stone shall be broken. Whomsoever it falls, it shall grind him to powder. I don't know, which option do you want? I think I want the first one. But guess what? We have to continually fall on him. And the rock is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And be broken, be broken be broken and it's not a one time <laughs> it's till that self life is gone and we're broken and then that's the place where he can form us into the image of himself the father can form us into the image of his son and so David when the father said unto him, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. It says in Psalm 89, verse 14, this is the key of David, the key of the house of David that I'm going to give you here. Psalm 89, verse 14 say that mercy and truth go before his face. See, there's the key of David. See, the father said, seek ye my face. 
mercy and truth go before his face. This is the way to the heart of the Father. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the way. And so, mercy is the cross. It's the outer court. It's the the brazen altar where the lamb was offered up as a sacrifice. That was the mercy. Mercy is a covenant love. A love that will lay down its life for covenant. He laid down his life to enter into a covenant with each of us. That was the mercy of the cross. It says in Luke chapter 1, I think it's verse 75, he says that he came to perform the mercy promised to our fathers. And that mercy was to lay down his life, shed his blood, that we could enter into that covenant love with him and come come to the Father through him. But we have to pass through that mercy and we come into the inner court. And what do we have in the inner court? We have the altar of incense. Mm -hmm. That is the altar of truth. It's where our words, our prayers begin to come into agreement with the eternal will of God. And what is that eternal will? That we would be one with him. John 17, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verse 24, Father, I will that those that you have given me be with me where I am. that they may behold my glory, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Where was he? Where was Jesus? He was abiding in a place of intimacy with the Father. The secret place. He was in heaven. He was in heaven while he was on earth. I I want you to turn here. If you don't have your Bible, that's fine. But let's look at this real quick in John chapter 3. It's important that we come into this revelation. John chapter 3, we'll just begin verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, or teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee. This is his reply to to why I can do these things. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. That word again in the Greek is a no then. It means from above. It's not the same word that Peter uses in in 1 Peter 1.23, born again of incorruptible seed. It's a different word. It's a no then, born from above. Jesus said unto him, unless a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus mm-hmm. said unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then I want you to jump up to, so this is why Jesus is saying he can do these things. Did you know that Jesus was born from above? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When the Holy Spirit came upon him, right? 
then he was able to do all those things, right? And he was actually born from above. Not because of sin. There was no sin in his life. But it's that born from above to where then he could abide in heaven. He came and humbled himself and came into the form of a man and humbled himself on the earth. And when he became born again, his spirit could reside in heaven. And this is what we're going to see here in verse 12, verse 13. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, the Son of Man which is in heaven. This is Jesus speaking this. This is before the cross. This is before he ascended in a glorified body. This is not John writing about after, because some people say, oh, this is John writing after the cross. It is not. See, the Son of Man, none of the disciples ever called him the Son of Man. They never did. Jesus is the only one who referred to himself as the Son of Man, of all the apostles, of, all, of his disciples. Now, Paul does later, but of, in the Gospels, no one refers to him as the Son of Man but himself. And some, some people that he was speaking to, when he was speaking of the Son of Man, they said, who is this Son of Man? Other than that, Jesus is the only one who refers to, this is very clearly Jesus speaking this here. And he says, And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, the Son of Man which is in heaven. <laughs> so Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verse 24, Father, I will that those that you have given me be with me where I am. Where was he? He was in heaven while on earth. And where are we? Do we believe? Here's, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? Do we really believe it? That we were raised together with him? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, and you who were dead in trespass and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the prince of this world, the spirit who now works in the children of disobedience, among whom we also had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires in the flesh and of our mind. But God, who is rich in his mercy, for his great love, wherewith he has loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us, has made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness. That word actually is goodness riches of his grace and goodness towards us through Christ Jesus. See, we are in heaven. That's right. If we are born from above, we are literally in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Right. Right. See, we are above principalities and powers. But if so if you were the enemy, <laughs> if you were the devil, what would be the deception you would want to bring on the saints? That we have to yet get to heaven. That we are underneath these principalities and powers. How did they stay in power over us? To get us to think that we have to somehow break through that. That we have to rend the heavens. No, we're above the second heaven. We're in the third heaven. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where is Christ Jesus? Far above all principalities, powers, dominion, and might. And every name that is named. 
do we believe it? Or is it just this intellectual thing? And we don't really understand it. But we got to get the revelation that Jesus says that where I am, they may also be. That they may behold my glory. You know what the glory is? It's Christ being manifested out of us. Mm-hmm. See, when we get the revelation that we are also there, he then becomes manifested out of us. Mm-hmm. Christ in you, the hope of glory. glory. This is the glory he's talking about. Us beholding his glory is Christ being manifested out of us. That's the mystery. That's the great secret that was revealed to the Apostle Paul. Christ in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But that can't fully happen until we believe where we are. Those who overcome are those who come into the revelation of who they really are and where we really are. But the enemy is continually trying to... (laughs) The spirit of religion, the spirit of antichrist, which is alive and well in the church, is this spirit to keep us in suppression under the second heaven. Where Lucifer and they have all their powers to keep us under that and to think that we have to somehow rend the second heaven. We don't. We don't. Praise God. We're in the third heaven. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But if we don't believe that, come on. We're not overcoming, are we? That's right. My prayers are being hindered by Are they really? Are they really? Or are we praying out of heaven? That's right. And we have to come into that revelation. Because he can't hinder when we're above them. But if we think what we believe, then yes, we are hindered. And Christ cannot fully be manifested out of us. Just as the Father was manifested out of Christ. Because he, that where I am, may they also be, that they may behold my glory, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And then he goes on to say, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these that you have given me have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them your name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. I've been in pursuit of that love. (laughs) Not intellectually, but, you know, intimately knowing that. Revelation transforms us. Head knowledge doesn't. I'm not saying head knowledge is wrong because it's part of coming into the process of of knowing, learning. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to have head knowledge. We got a brain, you know. (laughs) Be renewed in the, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, this is coming from the outer court to the inner court. It's where our minds are renewed to truth. And then our lips begin to come into agreement with that truth. Our confession becomes in, comes into agreement. And that's part of the covenant. A covenant is made up of two things. The mercy and the truth. This is the blood and the body of Christ. This is the Lord's Supper. It's the covenant of mercy and truth. See, mercy is the blood of the covenant. It's that love, that covenant love will, that will lay down its life. Not only 
did he lay down his life, but to enter into this covenant, to truly enter into this covenant, we must lay down our life, the first love. And the truth is the oath of the covenant. Those are the two immutable things that Hebrews speaks about by which it is impossible for God to lie. Right. The covenant love of mercy and the oath of truth. <laughs> the truth of who we really are. The truth of who we were created to be. The truth that was written in the book in heaven. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, your law is in my heart. Every one of us were written in the book. <laughs> I believe every one of us says, I delight to do your will, O God. But do we come into agreement with that? Or is it our will? I think his will is the best. <laughs> he wants Amen. to be one. And what else... What else could we want than to be one with the creator, the lover of our soul? We must return to our first love. See, mercy is actually the first love. It's the first love that will lay down its life. And Jesus came to the Ephesian church and Revelation is chapter 2, verse 3, and he says, you have left your first love. I mean, I think we all here know what first love is. When you first fall in love, you will lay down your life. That person fills your consciousness. You don't have to work to think about it. They just consume your being. You don't have to work at it. I said, like, oh, that's first love. But we're to abide in that place. And see, the spirit of religion and the enemy and the cares of this world draw us out of that place. That's what it means to abide in Christ, is abiding in that place of first love, that place of intimacy where he consumes our being. He consumes our every thought. Jesus said in John 15, <coughs> verse 7, if you abide in me, this is the key of David, if you abide in me, in my mercy, in my covenant love, and my word, my truth, abides in you. There's mercy and truth. You shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. When do we bear fruit? When we're in this place. It's, it's a covenant. It's the covenant relationship of this intimacy of first love where we'll lay down our life and we take the word of truth. His truth is living in us. We come into agreement with what his word says. That we are born from above. I am in heaven. And it's abiding in this place of intimacy. This is the key of David mercy and truth. It is the progression through the tabernacle. Mercy. The altar of truth. And in the very holy of holies where mercy and truth meet together. See, over the ark was the wings of the, of the cherubim, the seraphim, were over the mercy seat. And what was underneath it? The testimony of the covenant, the tablets. There is mercy and truth meeting together. So it goes mercy, truth, 
and mercy and truth meeting together. Mm-hmm. See, it says in Psalm 84, verse 9, the second part of that verse, it says, that glory may dwell in our land, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. That's in the Holy of Holies, under the shadow of His wings. That is the secret place of the Most High. David speaks of it often, under the shadow of His wings. That's where he's talking about. Under the ark, at the mercy seat, where mercy and truth meet together. David says over and over, Oh, prepare mercy and truth, which shall preserve me. (laughs) It's this covenant relationship of abiding in Christ. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm. What is the way to the Father? It's heart. The revelation of Jesus Christ. He was the perfect image and reflection of, of the Father. So the secret place is that place where we come into the full revelation of Him. And it's this place of intimacy of abiding in the first love of mercy, covenant love, and the truth of that covenant. We've believed many lies, haven't we? We were born into it. We were born into the lies. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To what? The truth. We're already there. We just have to come into agreement. And confess it. It's actually how we got born again was by mercy and truth. Did you know that? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. There's the truth. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. See, there's the mercy. There's the covenant of mercy and truth. There's the secret place. See, we were brought into it at the very beginning. That place of first love. But we were drawn away. The things of this world, the spirit of religion, the you got to do it this way, this way, this way, and there was an intimacy that was lost. You know, at seven or eight years old, I don't know, you know, <laughs> how quick that happened, you know. I don't know too many people that have abided in first love. I know some. Todd White and Dan Moeller are abiding in first love. And they're, I believe they're for a witness. You may not know who they are, but, but this is the revelation that the Lord is raising up. How to come into that deep place of in- intimacy. Does it, do any of you want that? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't want religion. I want intimacy. I want to know my Lord. I want to be one. You know, I want to manifest Him, not my ugly flesh. That's right. It comes out of intimacy. Intimacy is where we're transformed. Religion does not transform you. Did religion transform the Pharisees and Sadducees? (laughs) You know why? They had a certain revelation of truth, the scripture. They did not have a revelation of the mercy. They didn't have them both. See, you, if you have truth without mercy, what do you have? You have condemnation. Yeah. You have judgment. Is that not what they did? Because they didn't have a revelation of the mercy. They said of Israel, the way of peace they knew not. And the way of peace passes through the cross, the mercy. I am the way. See, the, the way is the way of peace that passes through the mercy. I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. This is the tabernacle. And the revelation of it is the tabernacle of David that has fallen. And he is raising it up to bring us into this deep place of intimacy that we can come, my people, enter into thy chambers and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be passed. Because he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover me with His feathers. See, there's the secret place under the seraphim, under the cherubim's wings, where mercy and truth meet together. Under the ark. He shall cover me with his feathers. The father doesn't have feathers. This is speaking of his seraphim that are over the throne. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And above it were the seraphim, each having six wings. They were over the throne. See, the... The Ark of the Covenant is the throne. It's, it's, it's all a picture to bring us into the revelation of how to come into the Father's heart where mercy and truth meet together in the covenant. Now his fathers, we will trust. His truth, his truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. See, it's mercy and truth coming together in the secret place. See, when it says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most House shall abide under the shadow, this is speaking of the shadow of the Father's hand. I'm giving you guys a lot here. But see, in Psalm 89, the Father's hands, it reveals to us the Father's hands. His left hand is mercy, his right hand is truth. Psalm 89.13 says, Thou hast a mighty arm. Strong is your hand. High is your right hand. Here the, the Father's hands are be revealed to us. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. It's the Father's hands. That is the throne. That is the throne. And he said, Seek ye my face. It's coming into the Father's hands. This is the throne. And the Father, when we come to that place, that secret place of mercy and truth, he forms us into the very image of his Son, Christ. So in the scriptures, it speaks about the Father's hands all the time. It doesn't haphazardly say this. It's very specific. The Father's left hand is mercy. His right hand is truth. This is the revelation that David came into. And in Psalm 138, for example, David says, Thou wilt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand shall save me. That's abiding in the secret place. Not, you're in a place of immunity. David came to know that place. Psalm 89 speaks of this. It says, uh, Then thou spakest in vision to the Holy One." And said, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, my mercy. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face. And I will plague those that hate him. But my faithfulness, the faithfulness of my covenant, and my mercy shall be with him. See, there's a place of immunity. When the Lord is beating down your foes before your place and plaguing those that hate you. Could anybody take Jesus 
They couldn't. They couldn't touch him. They tried to kill him as soon as he started the ministry. Right. And Nazareth, when he sat on the seat and said, today is this fulfilled in your ears, and they ran him to the cliff and tried to run him off the cliff the first day when he declared, I'm the Messiah. And he just passed right through them. In John chapter 18, when they came to, when Judas and, and all of them came with their swords and staves to come get Jesus, right? And Judas betrayed him with a kiss. And as, as they were approaching, he says, who are you coming for? They said, Jesus. He said, I am. And they just all fell backwards. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was that all about? You can't take me. That's right. I will give myself to you. See, why? Because he was abiding in the secret place. He was in heaven. He was abiding in the Father's hands. When Jesus gave up his spirit, he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's the secret place. So that he could draw all men to the secret place. The tabernacle is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. The progression through the tabernacle to the Father, where mercy and truth meet together. I think I'm going to close it here pretty quick because I don't want to give you too much at one. Um, I'll just try and... Uh... Let me finish out Psalm 91. Let me begin at Psalm 91 again. So I was talking about the Father's hands. His left hand is mercy. His right hand is truth. Why do you swear by your right hand? It's the hand of truth. And his left hand is mercy. See, it says in Isaiah 51, 16, the Father says, I have put my words in your mouth. That's truth, right? And I have covered you in the shadow of my hand. There's mercy. There's mercy and truth. There's the secret place. Isaiah 51, 16. I have put my words in your mouth. What? So you can speak them and come into agreement with who I say you are. What I say your destiny is. I have put my words in your mouth and covered you in the shadow of my hand, my mercy, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundation of the earth and say unto Zion, thou art my people. And so throughout the scriptures, we see the Father's hands. Wow. Because it's the secret place. Yeah. In Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2, he says, I have stretched forth my hands all day long to a disobedient and a gainsaying nation. What was the Father wanting? Intimacy, come, mm -hmm. come before me. but they didn't have a revelation of the mercy. And so their perspective of him was one of condemnation and judgment. That's what the law brings. See, that's what the law brings when you don't have a revelation of the mercy. And that's what it does to us. There's nothing wrong with the love. The law, it was love. 
It was love. Mm -hmm. But without a revelation of the mercy, it condemns you. You can never reach that point. I just can't, um, you know, I can't do it without this first love. Because in first love, it brings me into this realm where I'm being transformed and I just walk it out. It's not a work of my flesh anymore. It's this love affair. And Jesus said, you've left your first love. Repent. And so to come into the place of maturity, we have to come into this place of first love. And this is what I'm going to talk about in the next coming weeks. But Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. This is speaking under the shadow of his hand, mercy. There's two shadows spoken of. The shadow of the seraphims, the wings all all over the throne room, all over the secret place, but also the shadow of his hand of mercy. So it begins with the shadow of his hand, which is mercy, okay? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. David speaks about this refuge being mercy and truth. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover me with His feathers and under His wings thou shalt trust. His truth See, we got mercy and truth now. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. It's a place of immunity. A thousand shall fall by your side, and ten thousand by your right hand, but it shall not. Come nigh thee, because thou hast made the Lord thy refuge, the Most High, thy habitation. What's the next verse? I missed something there. No evil shall befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. He shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up. It says their hands. King James, that's italicized. It's not in the text. He shall bear thee up in the hands. See, it's the Father's hands of mercy and truth. It's the throne. They shall bear thee up in the hands of the Father. Lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Any offense, anything that would offend you. But when you're abiding in the secret place, you come to the place where you're no longer offended. They shall bear thee up in the hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone, a stumbling stone. Thou shalt trample upon the lion and the adder. The enemy, we're above, right? The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Then the Father says, because you have set your love upon me, therefore will I deliver you. I will set you on high because you have known my name. When you call upon me, I will answer you. Sounds like what Jesus said, huh? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. You shall call upon me and I will answer you. I will deliver you and honor you. With long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. What is that salvation? It's becoming one with him. To know him. I'm going to give you one more thing. This is a big one. The Lord released this to me um, about a year and a half ago. 
mercy and truth. Mercy and truth is in the Father's name. So when Moses said, show me your glory, in Exodus chapter 33, the Father says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And the Lord shall proclaim the name of the Lord. And so I'm going to skip over some. But then, well, no, I won't. Proclaim the name of the Lord. And, and the Father says, And I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful, and I will be compassionate to whom I will be compassionate. But you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me. That word man is the Hebrew Adam. See, no one in Adam can see me. No man can see me and live. And the Father says, there is a place by me. And you shall stand upon a rock. Who's the rock? Jesus. Jesus. And when my glory passes by, I will set you in the cleft of the rock. In Christ. And I will cover you with my hand. Here is mercy and truth. And so he tells them to go down the mountain, come up the next day with the tablets that he broke. And his glory comes in, descends by and stands next to Moses and proclaims the name of the Lord. Lord, Lord God, which is Yahweh, Yahweh El. What does Yahweh mean? I am. So what is he saying? Yahweh, Yahweh El. El is God. I am, I am God. Compassionate, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in mercy and truth. Wow. See, the secret place is in his name. This revelation, this is where it comes out of. It's actually in the Father's name. The covenant is in his name. This declaration of his name, when Moses said, show me your glory, it's the revelation of his very heart, the way into his very heart. He is compassionate, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in mercy and truth. Keeping mercy unto thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children and to the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And what's this iniquity? It's idolatry. It's leaving our first love. That's what Israel did. They left the first love. There was a time when he brought them out of Egypt. They were in a place of first love, and they left it. And they started grumbling and complaining. The enemy came in, right, and started speaking things to them. Oh, be back in Egypt, and you can eat the, you know, the deep-fried fat fish, you know, or whatever. <laughs> you know, when, when you first fell in love, but eventually what happened? Start hearing these, you getting the criticism, right? <laughs> you start seeing the faults. But through mercy, you don't see the faults. In that place of first love, you just see goodness. You see all the good about them and you overlook. And that's a picture of the first love with our Father. We can abide in that place that all we see is the goodness of God. What happened in the garden? What was challenged when man fell? The goodness of God. Did God really say he's holding something back from you? What was questioned? The goodness. So to come back into the glory, he causes his goodness to pass first. And so there's a whole revelation behind that. I'll get into that some other time. But. Goodness is actually that which flows out of first love. It's the virtue of first love. Father, quicken our minds. Thank you, Jesus. 
We set you as a seal upon our heart, a seal upon our arm. For your love for us is as strong as death. Your jealousy for us, as cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are the coals of fire that hath the most vehement flame of your love for us. Many waters cannot quench this love. Neither can floods drown it. If a man give all the substance of his house for love, it shall be utterly condemned. Lord, forgive us for leaving our first love. We love you, Father. Bring us back into (laughs) the dew of our youth. Where you fill our consciousness of you. Where it's not a work. (laughs) Just a simplicity of devotion. Teach us, Lord. Holy Spirit, teach us. Bring us to a simplicity of bringing us into the secret place that we may know that we are in heaven, Lord, that we may believe. Help our unbelief. Pray you seal your word, Lord. Lord, you speak to each and every one here throughout the week to bring this word to a simplicity in their own hearts. If it's just one point, Lord. I thank you for what your word says in Isaiah. I think it's chapter 60 that, Father, in, in that day you will hasten your work. I thank you, Father, that you are hastening that work in us right now. Yes, Lord to bring us into that place of intimacy. That place of immunity in you, where we abide in your hands. Yes. 